The theory of evolution. The theory that all organisms on Earth have evolved from simple to complex forms over a long period of time is supported by an interpretation of fossils. However, we have to remember that it's just an interpretation. We have to remember that what we're being taught today as science are interpretations of findings, not facts. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the fossil record. <clears throat> because fossils are typically found below or above other types of fossils, as shown in this chart, evolutionists argue that this arrangement of fossils shows that life on Earth has changed over time. However, for the fossil record to really support evolution, it must show an organism in the process of evolving from one type into another. All the fossil record really shows is that there are different fossils in different layers. Can they show, by a way of fossil forms, an organism in the process of evolving into a new type? The fossil record should be filled with intermediate fossil types called transitional forms. Well, at the time Darwin published The Origin of Species, the evolutionists of Darwin's day held to a a, view, a different view. They held to a view called saltation. They believed that evolution occurred in rapid jumps. And that's because when they looked around at living populations, they saw distinct groups. You know, you look at the reptiles, and within the reptiles, you see distinct groups. There's uh, lizards, and there's tur turtles, and then there's your snakes, distinct groups. Uh, the world is filled with distinct groups of organisms. And evolutionists believe that these animals would evolve rapidly from one type to another, thereby leaving these enormous gaps. Darwin argued against this, this view, this saltation view. He, are, he provided a mechanism for the process of evolution, a mechanism which he argued must be very, very slow and gradual, that mechanism being natural selection. Now, Darwin himself was an accomplished breeder of pigeons and drew from his own experience in pigeon breeding and generations of experience by other, other breeders of animals to argue that this process that pigeon breeders are performing in their pigeon coops and dog kennels and elsewhere is being performed in nature. That the way breeders of pigeons create breeds is the same way that, that uh, nature creates the various species, like the species of finches Dar Darwin observed on the Galapagos Islands, that they're created in the same way. But he argued this must be a very, very slow and gradual process. And Darwin assumed that the reason why there were distinct groups of animals in living populations was because of extinctions. That as they evolved, extinctions happened, so creating these distinct groups. But he believed that those animals that had gone extinct during this evolutionary process would be discovered, would be in the fossil record. But he actually gives a carefully worded apology in The Origin of Species that he can't point to those fossils at that time. And he uh, predicts that they would eventually be found. But here we are, 150 years later, and evolutionists are no better able to connect together the, these big groups of animals than they were back in Darwin's day. Their enormous gaps exist, and they are not, the, not being filled in by fossil forms. Well, James Valentine is an evolutionary biologist at uh, California University, and he makes this confession of what Darwin began. He says... The fossil record is of little use in providing direct evidence of the pathways of descent of the phyla or of the invertebrate classes. What he means is that we can't connect the invertebrate classes together by way, by way of fossil forms. We can't even connect the classes that make up the invertebrate phyla by way of fossil forms. He continues, he says, each phyla, like the ones represented by these pictures here, each phyla with a fossil record had already evolved its characteristic body plane when it first appeared, as far as we can tell from fossil remains, and no phyla is connected to any other via, via intermediate fossil types. Indeed, none of the invertebrate classes can be connected with another class by series of intermediates. So he's saying we cannot connect these various invertebrate phyla together by tra fossil forms, transitional fossil forms. We can't even connect to the classes that make up these phyla together. So like, like the, the mollusks that are that represented by here, the clam, are made up of th three different classes. The bivalves, like your clams, the gastropods, like your snails, and the cephalopods, like your octopus and squid. Valentine is saying here we can't even connect the classes in the invertebrate phyla together by way of fossil forms, much less the phyla themselves. 
More to, the, more to that, we cannot show by way of fossil form what evolved in the first Nidarian, what evolved in the first Echinoderm, what evolved in the first mollusk or arthropod. When these animals first appear in the fossil record, they're perfectly formed. No indication what evolved into these, and there's no indication from the fossil record which of these evolved into, uh, for example, the uh, first uh, primitive fish. The fossil record simply is of no use in filling in these big evolutionary steps because, ladies and gentlemen, they never occurred. Well, Stephen Jay Gould is arguably one of the most famous evolutions of our day, and I say this because he was uh, featured on an episode of The Simpsons, which, uh, you know, I guess is a claim to fame for an uh, uh, evolutionist to date. But he makes this frank admission, uh, uh, Stephen Jay Gould. He says, The extreme rarity of transitional forms persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data, data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. Well, Stephen Jay Gould and others went on to uh, propose a th new theory they call punctuated equilibrium to explain this, this tremendous absence of transitional forms. They argued that a, an organism, once it had evolved, had, uh, had uh, adapted well, it would uh, enter a period of equilibrium where it would remain the same for a period of time and would leave fossil forms during that period. But then they would evolve rapidly, in a very punctuated manner, evolve very rapidly, and in such a rapid uh, rate of change, it would not be expected to leave fossil forms, what they call punctuated equilibrium. But ladies and gentlemen, punctuated equilibrium is just saltation known by a different name. The evolutionists of Darwin's day held to this view called saltation. Darwin said no. Saltation can't be the way it happens because natural selection, like artificial selection and pigeon breeding and stuff, is a very, very slow and gradual process. These gaps in animals are due to extinction. Those extinct forms will be found in the fossil record. He pre actually predicts that that would be the case. But here, we, and, but here we are 150 years later. Evolution has been scouring the globe trying to find these transitional forms. But ladies and gentlemen, they don't exist. They don't exist. The evolutionary tree that is so popularly found in our textbooks today is a myth. It is presented without disclaimer, but it is simply without fossil support. It is mostly inference. Instead, what we find in the fossil record are the same distinct groups that we find in living populations Despite an enormity of effort, the primitive ancestors of the various phyla have not been found in the fossil records, nor have can evolutionists connect the phyla to each other by fossil forms. There are other problems with the evolutionist interpretation of fossil record too, like out-of-place fossils. Lots and lots of out-of-places of fossils have been found. The fossil record described by paleontologists is really better understood as a statement of evolutionary thinking or model of how fossils should be. Fossils are frequently found out of place, often by millions of years. Let me give you a few examples. The coelacanth predates the dinosaurs by millions of years and was once thought to have gone extinct with them 70 million years ago until it was discovered alive and well, living deep in the Indian Ocean off the coast of Madagascar. The Willoughby pine was discovered in 1994 in the Blue Mountains in Sydney, Australia. It was thought to have been extinct for 150 million years. The Loatian rock rat was discovered being sold as meat in a meat market in Laos, uh, after being thought extinct for 11 million years. In 2005, a mammal was found in a, with a dinosaur in its stomach. The discovery was shocking to paleontologists because it was believed at that time that mammals of this size did not exist at the time of the dinosaurs. To convince paleontologists that their interpretations of fossils is incorrect, you will literally have to find one in the belly of another. <clears throat> Another huge problem for the evolutionist interpretation is the abundance of living fossils. Organisms that are found in the fossil record but are still alive today are what we call living fossils and many can be found that are virtually unchanged. Many fossils dated in the hundreds of millions of years can still be found alive today virtually identical. Let me show you some examples. Stingrays are found in the fossil record by paleontologists that date back 50 million years but they're identical to the stingrays we have alive today. Squids are the same, even though they date back 160 million years. Lobsters are the same, even though they date back 200 million years. Cockroaches are the same. Shield bugs are the same. Frogs are the same. Bats are the same. And again, ladies and gentlemen, 
When these animals first appear in the fossil record, they appear perfectly formed. The first time a bat appears in the fossil record, it appears as a perfectly formed bat. There's just no indication whatsoever what evolved in the first bat. And these are highly specialized creatures. Flying creatures are highly specialized. But for the flying creatures, the first time they appear in the fossil record, they appear perfectly formed. Let me give you some other examples. Uh, the lizards, first time they appear in the fossil record, perfectly formed lizards. Centipedes, for perfect or centipedes, same as the centipedes we have today. Spiders are the same as the of spiders. Flying ants are the same. Uh, the t snakes and turtles, both identical to those that we find in the fossil record, and themselves create enormous problems for evolutionists. Uh, and how did how did the first snake uh, evolve all the extra vertebrate that it has, or how did the shells uh, of the turtle first uh, evolve? And turtles are so easily the turtle shells are so easily fossilized, one can hardly make the claim of poor representation of the fossil record for some of these creatures. But you can go on and on. Crickets, scorpions, flies. Generally speaking, animals are alive today. We can find them present in the fossil record looking basically identical to fossil forms. But arguably, the most, the biggest problem for evolutionary interpretation of the fossil record is what we call the Cambrian explosion. Cambrian explosion. In uh, the fossil record, life appears so suddenly that this Time Magazine article calls it evolution's Big Bang. The, sub, the subtitle says, New discoveries show that life as we know it began in an amazing biological frenzy that changed the planet almost overnight. It is a sudden appearance of life on Earth. So suddenly that it's called the Cambrian Explosion. And it's called the Cambrian Explosion because it is believed to have occurred during the geologic era or the fossil layer that we call the Cambrian. Rather than a slow and gradual accumulation of organisms like Darwin predicted, what we see is a sudden explosion appear in this one geologic era. A sudden explosion just suddenly appeared. As... As what do you expect if the biblical if the biblical record is true? <clears throat> Darwin was deeply troubled by this sudden appearance of life in the Cambrian. He called it an inexplicable mystery. In his book On the Origin of Species, he says this: There is another, an ally difficulty, which is much more serious. I allude to the manner in which many species in several of the main divisions of the animal kingdom uh, suddenly appear in the lowest known fossiliferous rocks. To the question as to why do we, we do not find rich fossiliferous deposits belonging to these assumed earliest periods, I can give no satisfactory answer. I can give a, uh, uh, I can give a satisfactory answer. Those periods were assumed, presumed. They never existed. Those periods never existed. God created those animals in the beginning. Richard Dawkins even said nothing distressed Darwin more than the Cambrian explosion. That's because Darwin's imaginary tree of life is simply not supported by fossils. Rather than the slow and gradual accumulation of kinds of organisms, the fossil record shows a sudden explosion of life on earth as God created them after their kind, which then diversified only into different species, not into different kinds. Let's summarize what we've seen. Do fossils support evolution? No. The, fossil, the sudden appearance of life in the Cambrian explosion argues strongly against it. The absence of transitional forms also argues strongly against their interpretation of the fossil record. We have an abundance of out-of-place fossils in the fossil record. We have an abundance of living fossils in the fossil record. All of them argue strongly against their interpretation of the fossil record. Paleontologists have looked long and hard enough for these transitional forms. They're simply not there. But instead, the fossils are strongly supportive of the biblical interpretation. There's a lateral continuity of stratus. The, the layers of rocks that fossils are found in are laterally continuous or horizontally definite. They can be traced for hundreds of miles in places we could trace them for thousands of miles. There's an abundance of ocean fossils in the fossil record showing that the, the oceans had inundated the land. We find fossils that are highly preserved showing that they had been buried catastrophically. And we find these mass mortality beds, mass graveyards of fossils. The fossiliferous strata does not does make up a record. 
but it's not a record of life on Earth over hundreds of millions of years. Despite the abundance of evidence to support the event, where you cite on this debate may ultimately be determined by where you place your trust in authority. Do you trust God's sovereign word or do you trust man's fallibility, man's fallible interpretations? When the fossil record is interpreted correctly, it is clear that it describes a terrible flood in the Bible. The sorting of fossils that you see here merely represents the destruction of the successive life zones during the global flood. There was a global flood, and the fossil record is a monumental body of evidence to this event. But interpreting these layers of rocks otherwise can be devastating, can have a devastating consequence because of what these rocks were always meant to mean. These rocks were meant to be a memorial to the end of time to remind us just how much God hates sin. When people saw those layers of rocks, when they saw those fossils, it was to be an everlasting reminder to them of that terrible judgment. A judgment that Jesus reminds us is coming again. Jesus reminds us, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. But ladies and gentlemen, just as God provided Noah a way to be saved from the coming judgment, so he provided us a way through his Son, Jesus Christ. All he asks is that we repent of the sin in our lives, turn away from these things that separate us from God, Jesus has already paid the penalty for us.